Mining. So, uh, yesterday we talked a bit about uh, dependent arising, and especially causal dependence, and how it affects or influences uh, the entire path, you know, and challenges us to speak, uh, to think more broadly. So, for example, in terms of... <clears throat> uh, the developing the aspiration for renunciation. <coughs> when we think about dependent arising, it is cause and effect or karma. Yeah. And then that helps us see how we kept, keep getting reborn and what are the causes of our samsara and what causes do we need to cease in order to be free. When we talk about um, bodhicitta, then dependent arising uh, helps us to see how interrelated with others we are and how dependent we are on them uh, just to stay alive or also for everything we know. <clears throat> now, that may feel very uncomfortable to keep thinking, I am dependent on others, uh, you know, especially if you're American. Yeah, in American, you are independent, okay? So this whole thing, you know, we pick ourselves by our, up by our own bootstraps, but give it a try and see if you can. Um, you know, when in fact, actually, we're very, very dependent on other living beings. And it's this feeling of depend of independence that... Uh, often prevents us from connecting with others, you know. And it's this feeling of independence that helps us get very stuck on uh, my opinions are the right ones, my way of doing things is the, the right way of doing it, and so on and so forth. Or I don't know, owe anything to anybody. Um <clears throat> You know, this this kind of uh, idea. So it comes out in personal relationships. It comes out politically. Yeah. But when we really look at our lives, uh, you know, I think actually more than any other time in human history, we're dependent on each other. Yeah. I mean, before, uh, people could grow their own food and, they could make their own clothes and build their own shelter. And now, you know, we are so specialized. We can hardly do anything without seeking the help of somebody else because we just plain don't know how to do it. And the world is too complicated now yeah, for us to know how to do everything. Okay, and then, uh, you know, when we think about uh, the wisdom realizing emptiness, then, of course, dependent arising is a proof for that. And uh, that is what counteracts this actual grasping onto, I am an independent person, just look at me, I can do everything by myself, okay? So I'm not, when I talk like this, I'm not saying that we should th just think, oh, I'm so dependent on everybody else, I can't do anything. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not the kind of dependence uh, that uh, dependent arising means. You know, that we just make ourselves into an infant who, who can't do anything. You know, rather... Uh, we see that we're all interconnected and we depend on others, but they depend on us too. And we have something to offer to the collective energy. Yeah, And what we do does matter. It does influence other people. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I find with so many things I, I need to explain it and then to also say what it isn't. Because so many things are easily misunderstood. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's do the recitations and a short period of 
observing our breath and cultivating our motivation. And then um, we'll go into the talk, and I also have a whole sheet of questions from yesterday, which I will try and go through briefly so that we can talk about some other topics too. (laughs) Okay. So uh, just remember before we do the recitations to uh, visualize the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha in front of you. The Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni is surrounded by all the other Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. The texts there that represent the Dharma jewel and of course the Sangha, the Arya Bodhisattvas, the Arhats, and so on. And we're surrounded by all living beings. So even in our spiritual practice, we are going for refuge, uh, imagining that we're leading all sentient beings in that direction. Yeah, they depend on us, we depend on them. We don't, mm, yeah. We have a responsibility to other living beings. So observe your breath. Let the mind settle. And take a moment and contemplate that all the talents and abilities and knowledge that you have uh, came from other people. And not only did they teach you, but they also encouraged you so that you could develop whatever skills and so on that you have. So contemplating like this uh, brings us a, a sense of humility because we see that it isn't just, I'm so smart and I can do this, but it all came on account of others. And so to use our abilities and pay it forward. So we can pay things forward in this life through whatever career choice or whatever that you have. But we also pay it forward through developing are uh, developing ourselves spiritually because as we do so we become better abled and uh, wiser and more compassionate in being of benefit to others. So with that kind of motivation let's 
aim for full awakening as a way to liberate other sentient beings and to do that uh, because we want to repay their kindness. Okay, so I'll try and go through some of the questions uh, more quickly. So, uh, first one, the child, who was an excellent musician, um, he brought seeds from the past, but uh, his mother said there was no one who was musical in his environment, so wouldn't there have to be cooperative conditions? Uh, yes, definitely cooperative conditions. He heard music on the radio. Yeah, he heard other people playing these um, symphonies and so on, and that sparked uh, the seeds and latencies in his mind to ripen. So how do we make use of uh, this life to ensure we all are always connected with the Dharma and continue to derive more and more joy out of putting the Dharma into practice in each successive lifetime? The best way to do to make sure that we have that for future lives is to do that this life. Yeah, to really uh, practice well, um, to have a mind filled with dharma joy, and to dedicate the merit. So uh, the long term goal of full awakening, but uh, for having future rebirths where we meet fully qualified. Mahayana and Vajrayana teachers, where we meet Dharma friends and have the opportunity to study and practice together, um, where we can live in good environments that encourage our practice. Yeah, so we um, purify, create virtue, this lifetime study and uh, understand the Dharma better, and then dedicate all that merit for awakening. And then, you know, it keeps going. So our delusions or afflictions completely independent from karma, meaning can I work on my afflictions despite previous karma that could go against my desire to improve? Um, afflictions create karma. Okay? It's not that karma creates afflictions. Afflictions create karma. The ripening of karma can put us in situations that encourage us to subdue our afflictions or encourage uh, the increase of our afflictions. Yeah, it depends what environments we find ourselves in. But of course, we have some choice about what environments we put ourselves into. Yeah. So uh, sometimes I find people say, well, I have to do this, and I have to go here, and, you know, I have to, I have to. And uh, actually, the only thing we have to do is die. That's the only thing that is for sure in our life. Everything else at the end of the day, is actually a matter of choice. So there may be strong forces pushing us in one direction, but there's always the choice to say, no, I'm not going to go in that direction. Now, sometimes we have to give something up in order not, to not do that, and we aren't willing to give that up. But that's our choice it's not that the situation made us, okay? Yeah, I mean, if you're standing there and somebody's aiming a gun at you, yeah, if you don't do something, even at that moment there's choice. Although most of us would be terrified and would do what the other person wanted. But there's still a choice at that moment, 
Okay. So yes, you can definitely uh, apply antidotes to your afflictions at any time you choose to, any time you want to. And sometimes difficult situations where we have some negative karma ripening actually is what gets us going in our dharma practice. Yeah, Because sometimes when things are going really well in, in our lives, uh, you know, this life is pretty good and samsara doesn't seem too bad, and so why should we practice the dharma? Now, whereas when we face difficulties, that often makes us really think, yeah, what is the source of my difficulties? What is the real purpose and meaning of my life? Yeah. So uh, very often difficult karma situ- karmic situations can, uh, can fuel our practice. Yeah. With some people, difficulties means they stop practicing. With other people, good conditions mean they stop practicing practicing. And with some people, no matter what conditions they're in, they stop practicing. <laughs> so that is all a function of our own mind, isn't it? And our own afflictions. Okay, do you think we have an obligation to follow scientific ideas of consciousness? if it conflicts with Buddhist ideas, especially if it has strong evidence. Yes, you know. uh, I mean, His Holiness talks very clearly that if science can disprove something in Buddhism, then we need to accept what science says because, you know, we're not here to uphold a religious institution or, you know, something like this. We're here to get at the truth. Now the question is, yeah, do scientific ideas about consciousness, uh, do they have valid proof? That's the question. There are many scientific theories about consciousness, but, yeah, can they prove that there's no rebirth? Can you prove the non-existence of rebirth? Can you prove that there's something that interferes with one moment of consciousness uh, being the cause for the next moment of consciousness? Can you prove that uh, the consciousness is an emergent property from the brain, of the brain? Which, again, I'm not quite sure what that means. Yeah. Yes, definitely. You know, the people who study the brain, you can find different parts in the brain that are activated when different things happen. You know, do people experience uh, different emotions or perceive different things? Okay. That doesn't mean that the brain is the consciousness. Okay. Just because certain areas light up and there's chemical and electrical activity doesn't mean that that is the experience of consciousness. Yeah, There's electric activity in a light bulb. Is a light bulb conscious? Does it experience pleasure and pain? If you put a brain out here, the physical brain, does it experience, does it Uh, perceive things? Does it experience happiness and suffering? Okay, so so chemical and electrical activity in the brain is not the same thing as conscious experience. Okay, so, you know, if scientists can disprove certain Buddhist associations, definitely, you know, we would accord with what science says. But if what they say is theories that cannot be proven, then it's something else. Hmm? Okay. Um, So thinking of anatta or selflessness, 
Yeah. If we are a, a bundle of constantly changing senses and sensory information and experiences, how can one determine what to prioritize other than trying to discern how not to cause harm? Okay, so this is an interesting question because if there is no truly existent self, who makes decisions and who thinks about things? Okay. The Prasangika and Giga come back with the question, if there is a truly existent self, who thinks about things and who makes decisions? So they come back with the exact opposite. Because we have a feeling, you know, that uh, this, and we've lived with it uh, our entire life and, uh, you know, <laughs> infinite previous lives, of there being a real self, a real person who kind of looks and surveys the situation and says, I'm going to choose to tie my shoelaces. Okay, or whatever it is we're choosing to do. Okay, now the question is if that self is totally independent of all other factors as it appears to be, then how does that self even know that there are shoelaces? Because being independent means that you aren't influenced by any other factor, which means that your eyes, if your eyes see shoelaces, the self doesn't see the shoelaces. Because, you know, if the self is something totally independent from the consciousness, just because the consciousness perceives something doesn't mean the I will the I being the capital one. And if it did perceive something because the consciousness perceived it, then it would not be independent. It would depend on consciousness, and in this case on the visual consciousness. When you think of how many factors have to come together for the decision to tie your shoelaces... You know, not just your visual consciousness seeing the shoelaces, but the mental consciousness thinking of where you're going and that it's a good idea to tie your shoelaces so that you don't trip. Yeah. And the tactile consciousness knowing how to move your fingers and sense the feel of the shoelaces and tie the shoe, tie them. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things going on to just have the thought, I'm going to tie my shoelaces. So just that decision is dependent on many, many, many other states of mind. So there's no single thing that is making the decision independent of everything else. Even though we have this feeling of there being an independent I who's doing it. Okay. So in other words, question what you feel. Question what you think. Or a book title, Don't Believe Everything You Think. Yeah, Because when we start to examine and question, often we find that you know, our initial feeling about things, our initial assumption that we've had our entire life is wrong. Yeah? So actually, if you're, if you're going to practice Buddhism, as somebody once told me, you have to get used to being wrong. Because if we were right then, if we were always right, then what could we learn from the Buddha, the awakened one? Yeah. If we're always right, we can't learn anything. Yeah. 
So then, why even practice the Dharma? Why meditate? Why learn anything? Because we're always right, whatever we think. (laughs) Yeah? So that's kind of self-defeating, isn't it? Yeah? Okay. Next question. If I want to wish happiness to all and freedom from suffering to all sentient beings, but... There's, you know, this is, there's always a but. Yeah, we all have buts, <laughs> more than one. Um, but I constantly stumble in my practice to include certain leaders, although I, need, I know I need to include them. Okay, so... You know, you want to wish everybody happiness, everybody freedom from suffering. But some jerk who has a lot of power, who's messing things up, you kind of wish he would get hit by a truck. Yeah. But, of course, you don't say that because that's kind of not so nice. Yeah. But inside the back of your mind is... Well, maybe that could happen. (laughs) (laughs) Like, if it happened, I wouldn't be too upset. (laughs) Okay. But then we catch ourselves and we go, look what kind of thought I'm thinking. You know, that's rather disgusting to wish somebody had harm. But the guy really is a jerk. (laughs) And he's harming multiple people and whole countries and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, how, how do we overcome this kind of aversion? So first of all, you know, especially with people who are prominent in society, they, whether they're, they're movie stars or sports stars or politicians or whatever, they become, in our mind, kind of like cartoon figures. They become a stereotype of what their role is. In other words, they do certain things repeatedly, and we just say, well, that's all this person is. That's all they think. That's all they do, Uh, you know. In every every breath they take, it's like this. Okay. And of course, we're focusing on their bad qualities. Okay. Now, if somebody saw us in that way and developed a, a cartoon character, stereotypical character of us based on our bad habits, would we think that was fair? We wouldn't, would we? We would say, no, that's just your stereotype. That's new, not who I am. Okay. So that's one thing to, to realize, you know, that people are very complex. And they are more than the, than the experiences that we've had with them personally. Yeah. I recall one time... Um, being at a conference, and I was together with a friend supposed to give a a session, and then the person organizing the conference at the last minute said, "Uh, sorry, uh, we're not going to have time for your your, uh, session, which was code for your session's not so important, which we thought it was. So this was somebody I didn't know very well, but once they said that, you don't want our session, but you don't know how helpful it's going to be for people, you know? And after that, I just, you know, everything that person did, I saw in a negative light. Everything. And for years, I just cleared steer of them because in my eyes, the whole meaning of their life was a one-minute conversation that they had when they said, 
it was probably even less than one minute, when they said, sorry, we're not going to have your, your session. Yeah. Based on that small thing, I knew everything about them. Yeah. So at some point, I realized that maybe, just maybe, I was a little bit prejudiced. Maybe I wasn't seeing things correctly. Okay. So I tried to open my mind and talk to that person and approach them from a completely different viewpoint. And of course, my feelings about them changed. Yeah. With some leaders and, you know, people in the press all that time, all the time, we don't have the opportunity to see them in different circumstances, okay? So what I do then is I think of them when they were babies, okay? So take your favorite politician, <laughs> your, your, your unfavorite politician or sports star or whoever it is, you know, and think that they were once a little baby, yeah, they were once like this big. Now, I know that that's hard because now they're well over 200 pounds, you know. But they used to be a little baby. And we all think babies are adorable, don't we? Yeah, and if we had seen this person when they were a baby in the supermarket, we would have gone, hi, and, you know, just made eye contact and been sweet to the baby. Wouldn't we? Yeah, that's what we do with babies. <clears throat> and if they were crying in the supermarket, we would try and distract them so that mom can finish or dad can finish shopping. Yeah. So they were once this little baby. So I find that extremely helpful to get over my fixed images of so, certain people. And then also, when I think, if I grew up in the family that they grew up in, what would I be like? And I might have turned out like them. Yeah, When I think of their family culture and what influences they had, what expectations they had from their parents, yeah, what situations they encountered, then I begin to see how they are conditioned by their environment. It's not like they have a fixed personality. They develop certain qualities and had certain experiences depending on many conditions. Yeah, and when I do that again, I see they aren't some fixed, permanent personality who is always the same way. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that helpful uh, to, to think uh, in order to generate compassion and tolerance and so on for them. And in fact, when I think of their family background, uh, it, I often feel a lot of compassion, yeah. And so it isn't just for people who grew up in poverty. People who grow up with a lot of wealth, they are very worthy of compassion too because their lives are so stilted by that wealth and what they experience growing up is so unrealistic very often, yeah, that we have to have compassion. What they experience as pressure from their parents, often, you know, the parents are like this on the kids, or the parents are out and they're so busy making money that the children of the wealthy feel unloved. Okay. So it can be really helpful to think of, of how somebody grew up and it, it enlarges our opinion of or our idea of uh, who they are and why they're that way. Mm 
Okay. Uh, COVID-19 started in a market in Wuhan where wildlife was sold. The market was closed, but the illegal trade continues. How does it relate to samsaric view of causes and conditions? Well, people have greedy minds. They want more money. They care more about their own livelihood than the welfare of society. Or they think that what they're doing is helping other people by providing these animals to them because in that culture these animals can give certain health benefits, supposedly. Yeah. So these people have their own causes and conditions that, you know, uh, has them continue to, to do that. And we created uh, the karma in previous times to be alive during a time when these kinds of things happen. Yeah. And the thing is, Oh, we're probably going to have more and more viruses like this as time goes on um, because of climate change and other conditions. Yeah. So uh, if, you know, these people can be discouraged from selling wildlife in wet markets, um, let's do that. I mean, also because it saves the animals' lives and ceases their suffering. So how do you view causality as it relates to COVID-19 and its spread from China to throughout the world? Well, causality, there's the physical causality of people who are infected going from one place to another and then them being in associate, close association with other people and the virus spreads to other people. So that's very much a, a, a biological causality that's that's going on, and like I just said, you know, we created the karma to to live in a time when this is going on. Yeah, so that is our karmic causality. Okay, so I tried to give short answers. I don't know if I was effective. Let's start the text. Okay. So the text uh, begins with homage to the guru. So Nupa Rigson Drak is paying homage to his guru, who we think is uh, Drakpa Gyaltsen, yeah, one of the other Sakya lamas, who wrote um, Parting from the Four Clingings, the text that we uh, chant at the abbey. Okay, and uh, Nupa Rigsindra continues, the great and holy Lama Sakyapa, who is probably Sakya Pandita. Um, that's probably who he's referring to. So Lama Sakyapa said that anyone longing to seek the supreme great bliss of nirvana must part from f the four attachments. And then he says these four attachments are... So the supreme great bliss of nirvana, that's referring to the non-abiding nirvana of a Buddha. Okay? It's not referring to uh, the nirvana of an arhat. So an arhat's nirvana, uh, an arhat has ceased the afflictive obscurations. Okay? So the afflictions and their seeds. A Buddha... Yeah, and a Buddhist nirvana has ceased those afflictive obscurations and, in addition, the cognitive obscurations, which prevent seeing the two truths directly, simultaneously. Okay? And you can tell that he's talking about the non-abiding nirvana of a Buddha um, because the four you know, of the four attachments to overcome. One is attachment to your own self-interest. And so there, uh, there's different levels of self-interest. <clears throat> but the, mo the subtlest one is the self-interest that seeks nirvana for ourself alone, which is an arhat's nirvana. 
Okay. So the four attachments. Um, so it's called attachment. Some texts say clinging. Some texts say fixation. The the um, Tibetan word is shempa, and shempa it 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 means grasping. You know, or it's like a it's a cross of all those words. You are holding on to something tightly. And you don't want to let it go. Okay. So the example, I think, because so many of our words that we use for Dharma are actually words that apply to physical things. And we take that word and then give it a mental meaning, you know, apply it to the mind. So the physical situation that I think of you know, when I think of this word attachment, grasping, and so on, is when we were little kids, okay, um, my little brother was, I don't know how old he was, but he was riding his tricycle, so he was tricycle age. And he rode his tricycle off the deep end of the swimming pool, okay, the, tri- the tricycle with my brother holding on to it for dear life sunk to the bottom of the deep end. Okay. My brother, who is now a doctor, so he's not a total dum dum, but at this age, he thought holding on to the tricycle was going to give him security and keep him safe. So he's at the bottom of the swimming pool. This is the kind of grasping he had onto that tricycle. That's the the kind of how we relate to these four. Yeah, we are holding so tight that we really can't. It's almost, almost, but not impossible for us to consider not doing that. Fortunately, the person who cleaned the swimming pool was there and dove in and pried my brother's hands off the handlebars of the tricycle and brought him up. Okay. But this was, you know, do do you see what I'm talking about? The, The intensity of the grasping? So it's like that. Yeah. So it's not just, oh, yeah, I'm attached. But it's like, you know. But, of course, we don't think, we don't recognize the depth of our grasping and clinging and attachment and fixation. Okay. So attachment to this life. Yeah. Attachment to the three realms of samsara. Attachment to your own self-interest. An attachment to a true reality or existence in things, which includes people, in things and their characteristics. Okay, so the antidotes are four. So we're going to go through the four graspings, the four antidotes, and the, the four results, and then just briefly, and then we'll go back through and go into them in more depth. Okay, so... The antidotes are four. As an antidote to the first attachment, meditation on death and impermanence. As an antidote to the second, reflecting on the faults of samsara. As the antidote to the third, reflecting on bodhicitta, the heart of the awakening mind. And four, as an antidote to the fourth, reflecting that all phenomena are devoid of self, like a dream and a magical illusion. And as you reflect in this manner and gain some degree of familiarity, four results will accrue. Okay? So the first, your practice becomes genuine dharma. Then your dharma progresses along the path. The path will clarify confusion. And as a result of having developed understanding and familiarity, 
conflu- confusion will arise as primordial wisdom, and you attain perfect Buddhahood. Okay, so let's start with the first one, attachment to this life. Okay, so about that, he says, first, the reflection on death and impermanence, which is the remedy for attachment to this life. To think about the uncertainty of the hour of death, to contemplate the profusion of factors which can lead to death, and to reflect at length on how nothing but the Dharma is of any help or use at death. When you have really cultivated this kind of contemplation, a desire will arise from your heart to do nothing except practice Dharma. This is when practice becomes genuine dharma. Okay, so attachment to this life. What does that mean? Uh, And why is it something to give up? Yeah, I mean, the whole world thinks, except a few people, thinks attachment to this life is not only right and suitable, but it's the source of happiness. Yeah? So if everybody, almost everybody thinks that way, surely they must be right. Okay? That's what we think. And, you know, this is what we've learned. So attachment to this life, what it means is... We want pleasure now in this life. We don't want pain in this life. We very seldom think beyond this life. We very seldom think, because we don't think of beyond this life, we don't think of causality And what kind of causes are we creating to have what kind of life in the future? So we don't think about those things. Why not? Because the attachment, the grasping, the clinging, the fixation on this life is so strong. Why? Because this life appears very vividly to our senses. The things of this life are so vivid to us. And we perceive them as 100% real. You know? So exactly how things appear to us, we think they exist in that way. And there's many levels of the way they appear to us. Okay? So, of course, the deepest level of them appearing as truly existent will get to with the fourth grasping. But even beyond that, or before that, yeah, things appear to us uh, to be pleasant or foul. Yeah. Things appear to us to be desirable or undesirable. Things appear to us to be conducive for our happiness or not conducive for our happiness. Yeah. And we think those appearances are out there existing in those objects and that our perception of them is they really are, you know, either fantastic or horrible. Yeah? We don't connect, we don't see that our mind has a very strong role in creating our experience. So just how things appear, that's how we take them. Okay? So... A a grosser level of this, without, you know, looking so deeply at inherent existence or if the objects are really there, is uh, how we, we think of pleasure and pain, 
Yeah. So, whenever there's a buffet full of food, we look at some food and go, wow, that's good food. And we look at other food and go, uh, I'll pass on that one. Okay. So it appears to our mind that that food is really delicious and the other food is really not delicious. Okay. We never think that that could be just an appearance to mind. It's very interesting. Try this. Look at your food and think of how you think that, you know, make a bite of food, place it on your fork or your spoon, and imagine what that is going to feel like, what it's going to taste like, okay? Because you've eaten things similar to it before. So spend a moment and just what's that going to taste like? Because you do have an idea. That's why you put that bite of food together. Yeah, because we want the utmost pleasure from each bite. Yeah, yeah. So you see that, you know, how people carefully take, you know, a little bit of that noodle with a little bit of this sauce and half of that vegetable. Yeah, yeah. It's called playing with your food. Yeah, you know, what your parents told you not to do, but what we all do. Because we want to style each bite so that it is exactly what we feel like tasting and eating at that moment. Okay? So, we have an idea. Just imagine that idea of how you think it's going to taste. And then put it in your mouth and chew it very slowly. And be aware of how it actually tastes. And see to what extent your imagination of how it would taste corresponds with your actual experience. And observe if the taste of that bite of food is something constant or if it changes as you chew it. Yeah. And be aware if, you know, how uh, right was your idea of, of how it would taste and how, how much pleasure did you actually get from it? Did that bite correspond with the amount of pleasure you thought you were going to get from it? Okay. Very interesting experience. Yeah. So that, that's one thing. Just, you know, to, to test and to see how our mind influences things. <clears throat> Another uh, way to check is to watch how you respond when you receive feedback. Okay. Now, I said feedback. Feedback can be complementary. Feedback can also be critical. I just said feedback. It's neutral. You're getting feedback. And observe how your mind interprets the meaning of that feedback. Okay? And how we make <clears throat> ourselves the center of the whole thing. Okay. I have a perfect example, but it'll embarrass somebody here. Um, <laughs> so let me think of another example. Um, okay. I mean, any particular thing. Uh, oh, okay. So somebody comes 
It's lunchtime. Somebody comes into the dining room, and uh, and they're holding a, a broken spatula that was taped together with blue tape. <laughs> okay. And they come in, and they just say, what happened to the spatula? That's all they said in that tone of voice. What happened to the spatula? Okay. Now, one person who treasures their spatulas, but who didn't break it, goes, yeah, what happened to this spatula? This is the Abbey's chosen, precious spatula. That's the best of all the spatulas we have. And somebody broke it. Ooh, you know? And then somebody else looks up and says, let's keep on eating. I really don't care about this. And the person who broke the spatula, yeah, maybe said, so what? Or maybe the person who broke the spatula said, actually, it was already uh, half broken. So I didn't break it. It was already cracked along that line. And the third person, you know, or the person who broke the spatula said, oh, God, I did it again. I am such a klutz. You know, it's really hard to break a spatula, and I did it. And now, you know, they came, this person came out in the middle of the dining room and said, what happened to the spatula? And I'm going to have to raise my hand. And then so-and-so, who is so attached to the spatulas, is going to tell me what a jerk I am and blame me. Yeah, and then somebody else is going to come and say, uh, you know that's an Abbey spatula and you broke it, you better replace it. You know, and so this person is like overcome in, you know, fear. Or, yeah, they're going... Yeah, they're probably going to blame me for breaking that spatula. And I always get blamed for everything. You know, why can't they just accept impermanence? We talk about impermanence all the time. This spatula is impermanent. Why are they going to get so freaked out about this spatula being broken and take it all out on me? You know, they always do those ego trips. I'm always the one that they pick on and blame for everything that happens. Okay, so do you see the diversity in responses to someone saying, what happened to the spatula? Yeah? Isn't that amazing? And even the person who who did break the spatula, the number of possible outcomes that you could have based on how that person interprets the meaning, you know, how that person, yeah, interprets what they think is going to happen. Yeah, because somebody's asked one question. They have a whole scenario planned out in which, you know, they're the victim or whatever it is, and they're already getting angry. Yeah. Actually, it was me who broke the spatula yesterday. But it wasn't me. It was the prunes in the box. (laughs) I didn't break it. Those prunes, you know, they're packed so tightly together. Yes, I taped it. (laughs) And I put it right in front of Venerable Yeshi's place because I wanted her to see it. (laughs) 
and little Wakunga helped me tape it. <laughs> yes, you did. Oh, no, Venerable Lamsell. Okay, so, okay, so the co-conspirator, yeah. But it wasn't me who broke it. I mean, it was the plums. Yeah, so blame the plums. Pre please, you know, don't blame me. Okay, but... <laughs> what? What did you say? <laughs> yeah, you're... Favorite. Actually, it was a wooden spoon. It was a wooden spoon. It wasn't a spatula. So it wasn't quite that serious, but it still was. You know, it was, it was a big deal, wasn't it? Yeah. The news of the day. The news of the day. Yes. You didn't answer anything. said was I put it in front of your seat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was your, your favorite crummy old wooden spoon. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's a small incident. But those kind of things happen so often in our life. Something small and we extrapolate and it's all about us and we're sure that X, Y, Z is going to happen, you know, and we're all prepared to defend ourselves. Okay. And then even if the other person doesn't say anything, we're sure they gave us a dirty look. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. Okay. And then we, we do our same old emo emotional thing of either angry at the person who noticed it, angry at ourselves, yeah, or flipping it off like, who cares? Yeah. So it, it's quite interesting. As if all, you know, the situation were exactly as we're imagining it. Yeah. And it's what's happening is total, totally our imagination. Yeah. So, um, a little homework for you. You know, be aware of this in your life and when it happens. And it, it's so interesting because if you're in a situation, if somebody comes in and your friend is sitting there, and somebody comes in and trashes your friend, you know. I gave you some responsibility and you didn't do it and you're always letting people down. And our friend gets upset, you know. Oh, we say, just, you know, chill out. It's okay. That person's upset. They're just venting. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. Just relax. But if the same person comes into the room and instead of looking at that person looks at us and says the exact same words in the same kind of voice. I gave you re some responsibility. You didn't fulfill it. You know, you let me down. You're always re irresponsible. The person said the same thing to me. We are bordering on an international episode. Yeah? This is serious. You say it to my friend, eh. You say it to me, big deal. Yeah. Why are you accusing me of being irresponsible? How do you know I was irresponsible? It's the pot calling the kettle black. You're the one who's always irresponsible. You know, our mind just goes off and running. And it all depends, the same exact words, whether the person looks that direction or this direction. Isn't that interesting? Yeah? 
how we create stories in our mind about what things mean and then get upset. Or we create stories about how good things were. Do you remember being a teenager and dating as a teenager and how afterwards you analyzed every piece of every conversation you had on that date, filtering it out for what kind of subtle meaning that has. You know, is that person going to ask me out again? Do they like me? Oh, I said that. I blew the whole thing, you know? And it's like nothing. Yeah. Have you ever had somebody come to you and say, you know, uh, you said this to me, and we really need to sit down and talk about it. And then they tell you what you said, and you have absolutely no memory of saying that. In fact, very often, it's something you would never say. I have this experience when giving Dharma talks, especially Dharma talks about anger. Somebody will come up to me afterwards and say, you said we shouldn't be angry. And I say, "Mm, really? Please listen to the tape. I never say we shouldn't be angry. If you're angry, you're angry. It's not a matter of should or shouldn't. Yeah. What I ask is, do you want to continue being angry? Does your anger benefit you? But I never say you shouldn't be angry. But that's what that person heard. Hmm? So I think we've all had that experience of people mishearing us and getting all flabbergasted about something. But we never do that with other people, do we? We always hear things correctly. Very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so those are some examples of attachment to this life. Because the attachment to this life is based on seeking immediate pleasure and avoiding immediate pain. So... Immediate means right this moment, and it can stretch until the end of this life. But we very seldom think beyond the end of this life. Yeah, about pain and pleasure beyond this life. (coughs) Okay. So this gets into the whole topic of the eight worldly concerns which actually is what I taught on last Friday night. Uh, This Friday night, Venerable SK is teaching, so I'll go on with it on the following day. But we'll go through them uh, briefly here, too. It never hurts. (laughs) Okay, so the eight worldly concerns, yeah. Um, Delight at receiving material wealth uh, and money. And dejection when it doesn't come our way, when we lose it, when it gets destroyed. (coughs) So this is in real evidence right now with uh, the high unemployment rate. And, uh, you know, the government was supposed to send out some of these, uh, what's it called, tax relief or whatever it is, our, our COVID payment, yeah? And some people got it, some people didn't. A lot of people went on the website to check up on it. The website, you know, I got two error messages yesterday. Other people were getting, you know, all sorts of things. It didn't work. Uh, So it's very easy. It's like, you know government is sending us $1,200. I deserve this. Yeah. I deserve this. I want this. I can't be left out of it. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of clinging to it. And uh, and then a lot of, you know, what am I going to spend it on? <laughs> yeah. So, every, you know, people, once they heard that they're having it, I'm sure everybody said, what can I buy? You know, because the government wants us to buy things with it. That's why they're giving us the money. It's not because they care about us. It's because they want us to buy things because that helps the economy. And the economy, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? It seems like the economy is actually more important than human beings. But what is the economy? Yeah, when you think about it, what is the economy? Point to an economy. Yeah. And who created the economy? Who created the stock market? And who gave meaning to the stock market? This is all human invention, isn't it? We invented the whole structure of the economy, and now we suffer from what we invented. And I don't even know what an economy is. You know, what, what does an economy mean? Yeah, buying and selling things. Who's buying and selling things? Yeah. Anyway, on a personal level to look and... You know, how much do, do we cling to our possessions? I told you the story of my beat-up plastic shoes <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And how often do we really, um, you know, I'm speaking delicately here because I know somebody will write and say, you know, people are really suffering because they don't have money now. And why are you joking about this? Yeah, because some people are facing moving out of their houses. They're facing not having enough food. You know, you have no compassion because you're joking about this. <clears throat> okay, so I beat you to the criticism. Um, yeah. I'm not, I mean, yes, it is serious. It is serious. But our attitude can make it more serious or less serious. Our attitude can make us more upset or less upset. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get at. That, you know, depending on our attachment to material things, we're going to get more upset when that's threatened than somebody who doesn't have so much attachment to those things. Yeah? So our degree of upset correlates very much with our own mind. Hmm? Because some people that face a situation... And here's where anxiety and worry and fear come in, which we've been talking a lot about in the BBCs, is, you know, here's the situation, and our mind extrapolates and develops a horror story that is going to happen immediately. Yeah, and we and this horror story, we have no other alternatives, no other external resources, no internal resources. We're going to suffer and die, and we're sure of it. Okay, and so we worry and we get afraid and we're stressed, and the situation, yes, may be one we haven't experienced before. And yes, it could involve suffering. But the degree of suffering is highly dependent on how we interpret it 
the situation. Yeah? And the tendency that we have to create a horror story, and you're going to say, how do you know it's a horror story? Because are you, do you have the same degree of fear and anxiety for somebody across the country who you don't know? Or does that fear and anxiety, is it as intense for every single living being? Or is it particularly about yourself and the people important to you? Okay? Our anxiety is usually about ourselves, isn't it? And at most, the people who are important to us. So there's something exaggerated in that, isn't there? Yeah. And also, what could be exaggerated in it is we say, I'm doomed and there's no other possible alternative to me winding up on the street and dying on the street. Okay? Because that's what our mind goes to, doesn't it? You know? I'm living on the street, and I'm going to die on the street. But to think, you know, is that really so? Nobody else will reach out and help. Nobody? Nobody? Yeah? Because what we're seeing is a lot of people reaching out and helping each other nowadays. Yeah? A lot of people reaching out and helping each other. But we develop the story that for us, nobody will. Hmm? And we have this money coming. Yeah. With the president's signature on it. Okay, so, yeah, is, is it really, you know? Yes, life is uncertain. The situation is uncertain. What was normal for us, what we took for granted, is no longer something to take for granted. But there's also a lot of possibilities in the situation. Yeah, and it might be difficult for the country coming out of this, for the world coming out of it. But there's also a lot of people who are saying, we could come out of this caring more for each other than we did before. We could come out of this, you know, really being kinder to each other and developing governmental policies that are more equality-based. Yeah. We don't know. Hopefully, that will happen. It may happen. It may not. It depends to a large extent on what we do and how we talk and how we act during the, the difficulty and after it. Okay. So my whole point in, in all this is look at the way your mind makes up stories about what is valuable and what is not valuable. Uh -huh. One woman in the, in the Dharma group that I taught in Seattle had, I think she had three kids, she was a single mom, and uh, she was living, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And something happened where she didn't have any money. Um, and so, you know, not enough to buy a, a nice dinner for her kids. So what she did is they had a picnic. They made a fire in the fireplace, 
and they took out the peanut butter and jelly and sat around just with the fire. They didn't have electric lights on. And they made each other peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And they told stories. And they had a great time together, she said. And she developed that, you know, as a way to deal with not having enough money to buy the food that she would have liked to give her kids. But it turned out to be this great experience for the kids. Yeah? So there's ways that we can bring our ingenuity to different circumstances instead of, uh, you know, instantly jumping to a foregone, foregone horrible conclusion. Hmm? Somebody may say, but we really may die. And that's true. In fact, we will die. Sometime or another in this life, we will die. Okay? Whether it's from COVID-19 or something else, we don't know. But we do know we will die. So isn't it wise to prepare for our death? Because if we prepare for our death, then death doesn't have to be terrifying and frightening. Anyway, when you believe in rebirth, you realize you've died many times before. This is not a new experience. You've done it many, 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 many times before. And the continuity of consciousness is still there. You know? And there may have been suffering in previous lives, but that suffering is not happening now. So whatever we may suffer in the future, it will cease too. It's not going to last forever. Yeah. So if we approach death more realistically, yeah, then our mind doesn't create, you know, these monstrous stories about it. Yeah. And you see some people who, you know, they've prepared for death for a long time, and when death comes, they're completely relaxed. They're not freaked out. I was with, you know, one Tibetan monk when he was dying. He was so calm. The people taking care of him, some of the Ingies, the Westerners taking care of him, they were totally freaked out, even though they weren't the ones who were dying. But they were like, oh, no, he's dying. Go run and jump in the Jeep. We've got to ride down and get the doctor and drive to the doctor up here. And what can we give him and what can we do? And, oh, the sterile. Blah, 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 blah. And the person who was dying himself was just like he knew what to do. It was no big deal. And his monk buddies, when they went into his room afterwards, you know, and saw how he was lying and checked where his heat, the heat in his body has disappeared from. The monk who did that came out and said, he's okay. And so his friends were not distraught either. Yeah, they were calm. They sat down, they did the puja of his deity, the self-initiation, to send him on, you know, hopefully to the pure land or to a precious human life. Yeah, they were relaxed. The Westerners were like crazy beyond belief. And they weren't the ones who were dying. And they didn't know him personally like his friends did. Very interesting. Okay? So, uh, you know, you see how we have to stretch our mind and expand it? Mm hmm? Okay, so it's time to close. Um, we don't have time for questions right now, but please write your questions down, and you can just print them out later for me, okay? And then I'll respond to them tomorrow. Okay, so remember your homework. It's to 
observe your mind and how you create your experience in different situations. You know, and watch how your mind exaggerates. <laughs>